Okay, chapter 13 of the book of Mark. You know, you remember what week we're in, right? In our lessons. Right? Monday was Palm Sunday. Jesus entered. This is the last week, right? And then uh, on Monday, he came in and cleaned the temple. Right? Tuesday, maybe, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't really give us, you know, on the next day, like he did on the, on Monday, the next day when he cleaned the temple, right? But then he's teaching, but he's not having any issues with the Pharisees and whatnot, any of the Sadducees, okay? And then in chapter 12, he actually pounds them pretty good. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in log robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who devour the widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers, these will receive greater condemnation. <laughs> That's uh, 38, 39, 40 of chapter 12. But then he's going out of the temple, starting in chapter 13. His disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. They're looking at the temple, right? Herod's temple. Why is it called Herod's temple? He had it built. He did a lot of building on it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. 40 years of building. <laughs> okay? You know, now the original temple was called what? Solomon's. Okay. <laughs> Solomon built it, right? right? David got everything prepared, <laughs> but the Lord said, nope, you can't build it. <laughs> You're a warrior. <laughs> All right. So Solomon built it. And then, of course, the Babylonians destroyed it. And then after the exile, they started rebuilding it. But, of course, it was just a, you might say, just a fraction of what it had been. Herod then sets out to make it a spectacular deal again and did, okay? Jesus, in verse 3, sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled, okay? What's Jesus been telling them? We're going to Jerusalem I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to raise again on the third day, and da 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 da. So all the things Jesus has been telling them about what's going to happen, and they're they're just trying to get an understanding. And I like what Jesus said when he says in verse five, "See that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying I am He, and will mislead many. How many people have shown up and said I'm the Messiah, <laughs> I'm the new representative, <laughs> right?" A bunch of them, right? A lot of them that we don't even know about today have come and gone and whatnot, you know. But, but even the big names like Muhammad or or uh, Joey Smith or, <laughs> right, you know. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place. But that is, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, <laughs> right? Have we seen nation rise against nation and earthquakes and all that? Oh, the last hundred years, we've had lots of that, haven't we? But be on your guard. For they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Right? At the end of uh, 
John, when we get, or Matthew, when we get the Great Commission, what does he say to do? Go to the, the whole world, right? Teaching and baptizing, right? So we know that that's got to happen. Well, for all practical sense, that has happened. Yeah, it's, it, it's happening. I mean, there, there are people that don't have the Bible because there's people, you know, of a couple of thousand people that have their own language. <laughs> we, they don't have a Bible yet, yeah. right? Yeah, but for the most part, you might say that's been done. And of course, now that you got worldwide television, <laughs> you know, it says, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who will speak, it is the Holy Spirit. Right? So when you're arrested, he didn't say if, did he? <laughs> right of course he was talking specifically to them but his message applies to all of us and at the end of the chapter he specifically says that his brother will deliver a brother to, to the death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death and you will be hated on by all on account of my name but the one who endures to the end shall be saved right people that are following satan most of which don't know that they don't realize you're either following god or you're following satan there is nobody else to follow so if you're not following god you're following satan whether you realize it or not but because of that you're going to hate the people that are following god <laughs> But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. What's the abomination of desolation? That's a good question that doesn't seem to ever have a set in stone answer. Well, it's first spoke of in Daniel, right? Back in chapter 9 of Daniel. But we have the, um, oh gosh, I can't think of his name, that conquered Jerusalem and tore down the inside of the temple and set up his own worship deal in there, you know, and then the Jews revolted and, and won and and uh, re reset up the uh, uh sacrifices and the whole deal around 170 B.C., right? So that's a, a sample of the abomination of desolation where the pagans take over the temple, right? And the Holy of Holies, right? Which to me is the example that, you know, because way back before the Babylonian exile, we have God talking about him leaving the temple, and nobody noticed. Nobody even noticed that God was gone. Right? Because yeah. if God was still in the temple, there's no way somebody else was going to take over. <laughs> right? You know, but at this point, it happened. And then, of course, in 70 AD, we have the, the Romans destroying the city and the temple. Right? Mm -hmm. You know? So, but... We know that in the tribulation period also, right in the middle, what does the Antichrist do? But enter the temple in the Holy of Holies and declare himself to be God. Well, for that to happen, there has to be another temple. <laughs> right? He can't enter the temple if there isn't a temple. And right now there isn't a temple. Okay? So that has to be built. Okay? At some point... And Jesus says, let them on the housetop not go down or enter in or get anything out of his house, but let him who is in the field not turn back and get his cloak, right? <clears throat> when it's time to go, it's going to be time to go, period. You don't need to go back and get stuff. Get out of there. In the Roman destruction, for example, those who went back in and got stuck there and then died there where if they had just fled to the mountains and then gone wherever, you know, they could have survived the, the ordeal because anybody in, inside 
The Romans were there to kill them. Okay? She says, but woe to those who are with child and those who nurse babies in those days, but pray that it may not happen in the winter. <laughs> He's not telling you when it happens. He says, pray it may not happen in the winter. It might happen in the winter. huh? Those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the creation with God, which God created until now and shall and never shall, right? When is going to be such a time of tribulation? That is, we know to be the tribulation period. We call that last seven years, right? And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, what's the elect? Believers. Believers. Mm -hmm. Who elected them? Another translation of elect is chosen. For the sake of the chosen. <laughs> Isn't it nice to know that God chose you? <laughs> why me exactly yeah I, I agree with that why me you know i'm a i'm quite a scoundrel myself right but god chose me for the sake of the elect whom he chose he shortened the days you notice that's past tense jesus is speaking of the future as if it had already happened because to god it's all one deal he created time. He doesn't live inside of time. Now, Jesus is as a human, right? But God is outside of time. <laughs> he sees the whole thing simultaneously, right? So when we say it's been 2,000 years, Lord, to him it's nothing. <laughs> but you realize that that's, we can't see that. We have a hard time with that concept because yeah. we live inside of time. And he doesn't. So it's kind of like if you got the globe and you're up on top, you can see all the way all the way around the globe at the same time, right? Just the top half. The top half. But the point is, you can see the whole 360 degrees. Yeah. That if you're down here, you can't, can you? No. Right. And if you're not in one speck, what if you're in 360 different places looking at the globe? <laughs> You know, and that's kind of like the image God has, you know, because he sees everything simultaneously. I just, I, you know, when he sneaks in these little phrases like that, <laughs> past tense, <laughs> okay? And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is Christ, or behold, he is there, don't believe him, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order if possible, to lead the elect astray. So people are going to be pretty convincing that they're Christ. But he's saying, somebody says he's over here, don't believe him. Because when Jesus comes back, the whole world's going to know it simultaneously. You don't have to go anywhere to see him. <laughs> the whole world will see it. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. Right? Now, that phrase, take heed, is now about to become the lesson for the rest, okay? But in those days, what days? Of tribulation. Days of tribulation, verse 19, right? But also in Joel 3.1 and Zechariah 8.23, the Hebrew phrase, in those days, refers to those tribulation years. So when he says, in those days, you know, Everybody who was Hebrew, and who's he talking to specifically right now? Peter, James, and John, and Andrew. The four kind of brought two brother sets, right? Okay? They knew exactly what that meant. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. Really? Really? He's also quoting well, Joel 2.10. If the sun is darkened, then the moon can. Exactly. But that's that Hebrew phrase where you give the, basically the same thing twice in a row. You know, uh, 
it's a typical Hebrew of Psalms has many examples of that where you, the two lines in a row basically say the same thing. Right? And that's what he's saying. And so, so well, where do we get all our light? What's it going to be like if there's no sun? Isaiah 13, 10 talks about the sun and the moon going away. Right? Along with Joel, Joel 2, 10. Right? Verse 25, And the stars will be falling from the heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. The stars are going to fall? Where are they going to fall? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess what we're saying is that we're not going to see them, right? They're going to disappear. Why are they there right now? Why is there all these galaxies and all that? To show us how big everything is. You might say to show us how big God is since he created all of it just like that, right? But on the other hand, I saw a mathematician pointing out that if you look at all the different things that are necessary to support life on this one planet, it takes this mass of the universe to do it. I didn't understand his equations, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? You know, and if God created all of that, because everything was created to support life for us right here. Even, uh, we were talking about this a couple weeks ago, Stephen Hawking had to admit that it appears that God created everything to put us here. Before he died, you know, because the, the scientists have now proven that the Big Bang Theory is a bunch of bulk, right? And it was, everything was created instantly. <laughs> See, uh, that's uh, you can't get your mind around that. No, because we're not God. You know, and we're not that smart. <laughs> None of our scientists can either. You know, they don't get it. Yeah, and if you and if you want to fight against God, right? You know, the so-called modern scientists. We have a lot of you know guys who who want to believe in science rather than in God, right? Yeah. Whereas the greatest scientists of all time have all been like Sir Isaac Newton, right? Have been big believers in God. <laughs> he spent more time studying the Bible and commentary on the Bible than he did in science. And yet he's known as by scientists as the greatest scientist that ever lived. <laughs> anyway... All this stuff is happening. The heavens will be shaken. Think about that. <laughs> what on earth is God about to do when everything is going to change? When all of the stars, the sun, the moon, the star, it's all going to change, right? Now we know from Revelations, right, we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth, right? And the light's going to come from God's glory. Can only imagine, and then it stops short. <laughs> yeah, I say. yeah, right? He says, and then they will see the Son of Man. By the way, that's in Revelation 1, 7. Uh, the Son of Man, mm -hmm. right? The whole world will see the Son of Man at one time. <laughs> Right? They will see the Son of Man. Now, Son of Man, remember, is Jesus' favorite title for himself, which also comes from Daniel, <laughs> right? Chapter 7. And it's used in Psalms 104 and Isaiah 19. Right? Jesus chose this, the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. His deity, <laughs> Jesus coming as God, King of kings and Lord of lords, right? Now contrast that to his first coming as a baby in a manger.
quite a difference, huh? Mm -hmm. The first time he came as the suffering servant to show us the way and to be the sacrifice. The second time he's coming as who he is, <laughs> the Lord God Almighty, right? And then he will send forth his angels and gather together his elect, his chosen. Now, if he's coming at the end of the tribulation and the rapture happens before the tribulation, we're already up there with him. So who is he gathering? Everybody that's in hell, I guess. No, everybody, people, the, people that are believers. Yeah, they become believers. Become believers. You remember the 144 witnesses? that he sends out during the tribulation, lots of people are become, will become believers during the tribulation period. And a lot of them will pay for that with their life, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? But there's going to be a lot of believers, but look what he says. He's going to gather them from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth. In other words, everywhere, all over the earth, any believer will be immediately gathered to Jesus, along with us coming back with him, right? To the Father's ends of heaven. That's us, right? And all believers who've gone on before will be coming back with them, and all of us will be gathered together, right? Okay? Now learn from the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near, right? He's giving you an example, right? This analogy that you all know about fig trees, <laughs> right? They all knew about fig trees. Remember last week we had the lesson of the fig tree he cursed. <laughs> this week he's giving you the example when the fig tree starts to have fruit, what's next? Summer, always, right? Okay? You know summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize he is near right at the door. When you see all this stuff going on, it's about time. I'm right at the door. But it'd be neat. While we're sitting in church this morning, and suddenly everything opened up, and there's Jesus coming on the clouds. It's a good place to be when Jesus comes back in church. <laughs> right? Right at the door. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass until all these things take place. What does that mean? Anybody have an idea? We have a lot of Bible scholars that say that this fig tree example is a representation of the nation of Israel. When the nation of Israel comes back into being, that generation will not pass away. Well, it's been 70 years now. <laughs> yeah. Right? Matter of fact, today is May 14th. Today is the 12th. Tuesday will be the 14th. Didn't Israel become a nation on May 14th, 1948? If I remember my dates, which is questionable, <laughs> right? Well, 71 years come Tuesday. <laughs> Nonetheless, point being is that I'm not sure that's what that means, right? Exactly, you know, based on the 70 years. And there's lots of speculation as to what this parable really aligns up to. But the most important point is we're seeing these events that he's talked about and he's telling us that he's right at the door. So whether it's this year, next year, 10 years, remember, because in God's scenario, all time is the same, right? <laughs> you know. Well, first 32 gives, us, gives everybody an hour. <laughs> well, it tells you you don't know for sure, right? You know, 
But the other thing that's really important is in 31. Heaven and earth will pass away. Let's just stop there, right? Heaven and earth will pass away. Well, if heaven passes away, where will Jesus be? He's going to make a new heaven. Whatever the place is, of course, heaven is actually where Jesus is, you know, but whatever the place is where the, the, those who have died in Christ and have gone on to be somewhere, right, that somewhere is going to be different because he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, right? But if you ever stop and think about what he just said, heaven and earth will pass away. All these so-called scientists that think they're so smart, they think the universe has always been here. Always will be here, right? But we don't have to worry about it because the sun's got another billion years before it burns out, right? <laughs> That's not what Jesus is saying. <laughs> so God himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And again, this is Isaiah, heaven and earth will pass away, right? Isaiah 65, 17, same thing. My words will not pass away, Isaiah 51, 6. Almost everything Jesus said in the New Testament were quotes from the Old Testament, <laughs> quoting himself because he wrote it too. <laughs> right? Right? But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So why would Jesus not know since he's 100% God and 100% man? Well, how can he know? Well, there are things that Jesus hid from himself in his humanity, right? Yeah. He didn't walk around showing his glory except in the transfiguration, right? There are things that he hid, right? Because he was here to be the servant. He was here to follow the Holy Spirit and do the will of the Father, right? So in his humanity, he did not know. Now, as soon as he died on the cross, I'm sure, because in his, in his godhood, right, he knows everything. <laughs> so I think it's just an example of the little thing that Jesus did in his humanity, right? But he wanted to make a point, right? He had to do all the suffering that we would have experienced had we been in his place and to deny himself his glory. Yeah, just think what he could have done from the cross if he wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> right? And in his humanity, he probably wanted to. <laughs> it's like he said in the garden, right? Not my will, right? But thy will be done, right? You know, he had times where he was like, I don't want to die. I don't want to go through this punishment. Right? But that's why I was born. That's why I came. So he was uh, honoring God and obedient to the death, as Paul wrote. God caused Paul to write, right? Okay? So he's done all of that, but he's making a point for us, right? Because he's saying no one knows. So you can spend your whole life trying to figure out when this is going to happen. You're not going to figure it out. Do you think that uh, it's kind of such, you know, sense, that, do you think that he was uh, aware, even as a child, I do. what he was there for? I do. You know, the comments that he's quoted is thinking when he was a child to his mom. Yeah, at him. 12 years old. Why, why would you look for me somewhere else? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on, Mom. <laughs> right? Yeah, I do. I think he knew who he was because he was God, right? Yeah. But he had to constantly surrender 
to the Father, right, in all his actions, his entire life. Okay. What time we at, Jack? I got 25 too. Really? Okay. Take heed. Be on the alert, right? You're supposed to be in there praying the preacher. You are. Nope. Yeah. Just be on the alert. Do not know when the appointed time is. See, you don't know, but be aware. I've told you all this stuff is about to happen. I've told you, you will see I'm at the door, right? You don't know when I'm going to open it. <laughs> you don't know when I'm coming on the clouds of glory, right? But be ready. It says it is like the man that went on a journey and upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task and commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Second time, right? Not counting back up in earlier verse. Therefore, verse 35, be on the alert. We should be expecting him every day. Every day. If we get up in the morning thinking, today's the day. How am I going to live my life today? Because today is the day. If we started our day with that thought, how would your day be different, right? How would you be acting? What would, how would you treat other people? For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or the midnight or the cock crowing or in the morning. These are the four watches in the Roman count, the daily calendar, right? So he's saying it could be any time during the day. <laughs> you know? And I happen to think it's probably 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Jerusalem. Since that's when he died. <laughs> but that's just speculation on my part. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> right? But this, so he's saying it could be any, any of these times. Right? Lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. <laughs> be on the guard. Right? You know, because he's certainly coming back. What does First Thessalonians 5 2 say? For yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like the thief in the night <laughs> when you don't expect it. Right? And that's what happens is we're like, well, he didn't come today, he didn't come yesterday, and you know. So who knows when he's gonna come with you know, da, 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 you know and then boom. <laughs> When you least expect it, there he is, right? And we're at that point. Can you think of anybody who's really expecting Jesus to come back today? A lot of people. You know, they're expecting to come back today. You know, very few people on earth are actually expecting today to be the day. We're all living our lives just like, and what does it say? That people will be marrying and giving, you know, giving in marriage and all that stuff going on just like normal and then boom <laughs> everything wraps up you know that's what's going to happen in the last verse and what I say to you I say to all be on the alert four times in these little verses he tells us be on the alert which kind of matches the four watches it could be any time during the day you know He's saying, you should be uh, watching for me all the time. And the point is, again, how is our attitude? How do we live our lives if we're constantly thinking, you know, it might be today. I can tell you, I would be different if I actually got up in the morning and, and acted and thought that way. I wouldn't be as worried about what got done and da-da-da-da-da, <laughs> Do what you need to do, trust God for the rest, and be on the alert. Questions or comments on Mark chapter 13, when Jesus is talking about <laughs> the end times. <laughs>